Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Five Steps to Defend from Targeted Attacks with Security Integration. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of this presentation today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If at any time you have a technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. Time permitting, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides and you may respond to that email that I send out uh, to earn a CPE credit for attending the webcast today. So now let's get on with the presentation. Our presenters today are Rick Holland, Principal Analyst at Forrester Research, serving security and risk professionals, and Tim Erlin, Director of Product Management and Security and IT Risk Strategist at Tripwire. To see their full bios, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your screen. Welcome to you both, gentlemen. So now, without further delay, I'd like to turn it over to Rick Holland. Take it away, Rick. All right, thank you for the introduction, Kate, and thanks everyone for joining us. I know you have busy jobs, so setting aside part of your day um, is no small feat, so thank you for that. Um, I always start off with uh, the latest uh, the latest breach for us to kind of talk about. It's interesting, even uh, sometimes from the time I even do the slide, you know, one or two days later before we present, there's been another one that pops up for us. But so far, Anthem is still kind of the main one um, in the headlines that we know about right now. Um, you know, Anthem in many cases is, you know, similar to what we saw with the community health last year with the, the healthcare industry being targeted. Um, it's pretty interesting. We'll see, uh, there'll be a lot more details to come out on this. You know, one, one just quick observation here is their, their CEO, came out with this personal note, um, which gave a kind of personal touch to, to the apology. Some, some organizations don't do that, so that was good. And they also detected this breach themselves um, and reported it. So we'll see what else comes out over, over time. But I think this is, this is a good description of, of the threat landscape that we're dealing with today. And when I talk to my clients, you know, this is pretty much the way they feel. You know, migraine headaches, <clears throat> overwhelmed, tired head, um, you know, looking – looking for ways to deal with the threats. Um, the number one inquiry type that I get from customers, a Forrester client can set up basically unlimited 30-minute calls with the analyst on any topics for our coverage areas. And for everything I cover, the number one macro you know, narrative that I get from my customers is we're overwhelmed with the threat landscape and how do we deal with that. So what I decided to do last year was I wrote some research that I called the uh, Target Attack Hierarchy of Needs. And that's what we're going to kind of walk through today with a special lens on integration. So we'll be weaving in the integration theme uh, throughout the conversation as we continue this. But I'm not going to go through every step of this uh, hierarchy um, as in today's webinar, but I'll give you the high level of it, and then we'll dig into certain level, certain certain components of it a little bit deeper. You know, at the bottom is actually having a strategy, and we're going to talk more about that. The second piece is people. Um, it doesn't matter what technology you have, if you don't have good people, either your own people or people that are coming through a managed service provider or even from software as a service as you're kind of outsourcing some of the people component um, there, you know, people are really, really important. Uh, then the fundamentals, um, then moving up to the key part that we're going to be talking about today is on uh, integration and orchestration and automation and then prevention and then finally detection and response. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into a number of different ones of these um, areas, and then um, uh, we'll kind of go from there. If you're interested in more, I've done full webinars. I can point you in the direction on, on certain areas of this. But the first part is, I think, the most important part, and uh, that's to actually have a strategy. Um, 
I, I'm somewhat amazed sometimes in the conversations I have with security leaders, and I ask them what their strategies are. And a lot of times, it's a, it's very technology focused. Um, we're going to buy whole disk encryption, which is kind of strange for a healthcare company to tell me that because probably should have had whole disk encryption on laptops years ago. Um, or we're going to roll out DLP, very technology focused strategies, and that's not a that's not a good idea. Um, I like to call the technology focused strategies uh, expense and depth meaning we just buy and buy and buy more things. And I actually used to be a perpetrator of expense and depth. When I was a practitioner, my practitioner job before coming to the dark side was at an incident respond, as an incident responder in higher education at a university. And so I had a lot of input on the technologies that we bought. And uh, I always wanted the best and the greatest and whatever the latest silver bullet was, it was out, you know. Far be it that it did not actually integrate into anything that we did. Um, that was kind of beside the point. So a lot of the things I talk about as an analyst are because of mistakes that I made as a practitioner. And this is this is what what I think largely defense in depth has become is just buying more things. And I think organizations really need to look at any investment they make in technology, not just technology but process and people as well. Is where do you stop getting you know the the return on your investment? Where do you start to experience? marginal returns. And obviously you want to have that red line as far to the left as possible so that you're not wasting your resources, your time, and your money. Um, and I think a lot of organizations don't really have a good feel for their security investment and, and where they fit here. So I would challenge you to think about you know, if you control investment or if you control particular functions within your organization or technologies within your organization, is try to find out where you fit on this line. And, and one, of the, one of the key things here is before we make new investments, is we've got to understand our current state. Um, I'm going to talk more about prevention and, and detection and response in subsequent slides, but you know, what's your mix of prevention investment versus uh, detection and response investment? Um, if you're buying something new, do you already have that capability in another piece of technology that you're not already leveraging? You know, it's really important. You know, we, we, We've kind of passed through the budget cycle. Now we're on to the investments. I was having lots of calls in September time frame, September, October, and a little bit into November about what's our 2015 budget going to look like, where are we going to be spending our limited resources on. And really, I think budget time is a good time to do it, but if you haven't done it, inventory your portfolio and what capabilities do you have for detection, for prevention, um, and, and, and what data are you getting from these sources, and, and really try to do a gap analysis and see what you're missing. Um, before you go buy something new. Uh, that that kind of touches on the kind of technology focus, and I think we need to move away from the technology focus. If you're a Forrester client or if you've seen any of us speak in the past, you may have heard of the zero trust model. This is something my colleague John Kinderbaugh came up with probably four years ago. Um, and, and zero trust is, is kind of built on, if you think back, and I remember net screen firewalls, or PIXs, whatever the case may be that you may have managed in the past, had a trusted port and an untrusted port. And untrusted went to the Internet and trusted went to the inside interface. Uh, really, there is no uh, trusted port. We shouldn't have that anymore. We should assume everything is bad. Uh, it could be the malicious <clears throat> insiders, you know, like uh, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden. It could be people trying to commit fraud. It could be the malicious outsider that's made it inside the environment and is trying to do things. You know, that's what zero trust is, is basically saying. And we have, I don't know, maybe eight pieces of research on zero trust. So I'm just going to kind of give you the, the elevator pitch for it basically here. But, you know, zero trust assumes that trust but verify is dead. There is no trust. We're going to verify everything. Uh, we basically design our networks from the inside out. You know, we segment our networks based on the important data that we're trying to protect. And then we have inspection of all traffic. Um, so this is network-based inspection. We get visibility. Think of this as you know, uh, network security uh, awareness. And then also that extends to the endpoint. As more and more endpoints are outside of our perimeter beyond our security controls, uh, we need that visibility there. So Zero Trust is really about designing a network around the data we're trying to protect and instrumenting the network and, and, and endpoints, servers that are inside that environment to have visibility. And then the key component here is around data-driven security, not alert-driven security. We're so overwhelmed. You go back to that gentleman that I had holding his head several slides ago. Uh, we're so overwhelmed with alerts. Um, if you look at your environment, if you look at breaches that have occurred, right, a lot of these organizations are very similar to you. They've had SIMs. They've had malware sandboxes, but we're still getting overwhelmed. I think 
organizations are so you know struggling so bad that they're really looking externally for the easy button and some piece of technology it could be threat intelligence could be a sandbox whatever the case may be that's going to solve their problems you know the fundamental challenge that we need to address and overcome is understanding what's important to our organization um, understanding what's important to our organization and then also understanding what the adversaries are targeting if you go back to the healthcare example that I used from before last year community health who would have thought in their threat model that healthcare necessarily would have been targeted, I'm sure they didn't think this, by a state-sponsored actor. That threat model has changed. So we need to know who's targeting this. Um, Forrester has a whole playbook designed uh, for understanding data and uh, trying to, basically we have uh, several areas on it. We have uh, you discover your data, classify your data, defend it, and then most importantly, you defend your data. Um, uh, I'm sorry, dispose of your data when it's not used. Uh, it's not useful anymore. Good example here, which everyone's um, current on, is Sony Pictures and the emails that were there. A lot of these embarrassing emails. Um, you know, we need to have a way to retire the email when it's no longer a, a, a useful to us, and that goes beyond email to our larger, larger security program. So, so those are kind of components for zero trust, uh, for data-driven security which really are the foundation for actually having a sound strategy for your organization. So Rick, when you talk about data-driven security and, and having a strategy, part of what I'm hearing there is really about connecting security to the, the business in which you exist. Do you have any, any concrete examples of how a, an information security professional might actually start to do that in an organization where that connection hasn't traditionally existed? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it brings back personal pain for me. When I was in EDU, we rolled out DLP, and we just, you know, part of it was our fault, and, and part of it was the strategy of the vendor that we were working with. They're like, just just tap this. We'll look at your email and web traffic, and, and all of a sudden, we see all kinds of stuff flying across the network. We didn't know who to talk to. We didn't know why it was there. Was it legit? Was it not? And, you know, as I said, mistakes I've made kind of, you know, send me on my path as as, as an analyst. And... We, we, made, we, we made all the wrong steps here on trying to understand um, what's important to the business, tying security to that. You know, a number of ways, you know, one of them I, I had on the slide but I didn't actually uh, talk about, uh, was what generates revenue. Now, obviously, you have to be a for-profit organization, but do you know what generates revenue for your, for your organization? And do you know the assets and the people that are associated with that revenue generation? Now, if you're a nonprofit or if you're an agency, you know, what is your mission? What are you trying to accomplish? And, you know, what are the same, what's the same approach here, assets and people? Now, for public companies, you know, there's a number of things that you can look at. Um, 10 case is a good example. So the, 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 the SEC filing uh, has a number of areas on risk and what could cause, you know, a threat to the business. It's actually an interesting exercise. I haven't done this for Anthem. Um, I usually do it for other victims or other people that have been breached. But you look at their 10K and just see, if they have cyber risk down. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know the case may be, many of these organizations that get compromised have uh, cyber risk, um, hacktivists, that sort of thing in their 10Ks. So just because they've acknowledged it as a risk doesn't mean um, uh, that the problem is going to be solved. But I think if you look at your financial statements, if you, if you join your earnings calls and start understanding what the business is doing, and, and that can make you have an informed conversation. You can reach out to your business colleagues, people, you know, chief operations, um, and say, hey, I heard about this. You're informed. It raises your awareness, and you can start having these conversations. I mean, ultimately, this is people skills, relationship building, you know, moving outside of the boundaries of, of InfoSec into the business proper um, and, and understanding what's important to them and then building out a program around that data. There's no easy button for this. This is why it's been a challenge you know, eight years ago when I was practitioner, seven, eight years ago to, to now, it still continues to be. But I think everyone should, if you're a public company, you should know what the risks are to your organization on a 10K and then see how your program can help mitigate those risks. Excellent. Good deal. So that's step one. Uh, what about step two? So this would be the focus on the fundamentals. Um, this is oftentimes... You know, we're, we're, we're looking to threat intelligence, we're looking to sandboxes at the expense of other parts of our program. And I have a number of examples that I used in the research, and then I have another one that we'll dig into a little bit deeper, but some really common ones that I see people kind of skipping is two-factor authentication. If you're not doing 
two-factor authentication for your remote-facing uh, applications, you need to do this now. This is, this is huge. Adversaries are comp compromising Microsoft OWA. Adversaries are using your Citrix to connect to your environment, your VPNs. Now, Community Health, I think, was a uh, heartbleed uh, against the Juniper uh, firewall uh, for the VPN. Can't do anything about a zero day, but uh, you still need to be focusing on that. So two-factor wouldn't save you in the case of a zero day. But I would say right now, if there's there's one one good takeaway here from a fundamental from your organization is look there. You know, another component is is uh, everyone has local admin rights. This one's tough. I've been in environments where everyone has local admin rights. It's tough to pull that away. If you have something on the endpoint that can tell you how an application is using uh, the operating system, you can start to tighten that down. That's challenging to to pull out. Same username and password across the entire environment. You know, later, more recent versions of the Microsoft server uh, infrastructure allow you to have dynamic username and password combinations. But if you have the same one everywhere, bad guys can just start pivoting all over the place. I crack, I crack Rick Collins' local admin password, and that is the entire company, so I can just pivot all over the place. No egress filtering. Now, bad guys are tunneling over protocols that, like DNS and HTTP and HTTPS, they're legit. But force them to use those channels. Don't let them use whatever they want. Um, and then privilege access man monitoring. Right? They're trying to get to credentials. We need to have visibility there. Now, just because you say it's a fundamental doesn't mean that it's easy. Right? So don't mistake that. That's, that's a good reminder to have. It still can be complex. Uh, but I think these are really, really important. And a lot of them uh, reduce attack surface for the bad guys. And I think that's one thing that I wanted to talk about next is on vulnerability management. And vulnerability management really is a core function. And you know, I, I've, I've run vulnerability management programs as a sales engineer. I sold a lot of vulnerability management solutions, and now, of course, I cover them as an analyst. And it's often overlooked. It's a very mature space. You know, I think all of the open source, and I don't know what the experience was in your organization for this, uh, but the heart bleeds and the shell shocks and the poodles of the world, you know, started making in my customer base um, a higher perspective of these guys. Um, and, and made people think about it. So there's kind of a renewed focus for that. But really, vulnerability management is important. It's absolutely critical to reduce attack service. Just like you, you want to not let the bad guys use whatever port and protocol to do their command and control or do their data exfiltration, by the same token, you don't want to make it so easy that they can attack a million different ways. Let's reduce the ways that they can come into the environment. So uh, you mentioned you know, shell shock and heart bleed and, and how um – uh, what I would call 2014, the, the year of the, the marketed high-profile vulnerability in some ways, and, and how that's, that's changed a little bit the perspective on vulnerability management. Do you think that that experience has affected how organizations view some of the, the you know, forgotten fundamental controls overall? Yeah, I think so. I think in my experience, this was making it up to the sea levels, particularly at Heartbleed. Um, you know, the sea level, you know, beyond the security group, and above the IT operations group, you know, executives were like, wow, we just saw this in the news. How, we know that it cost us $200,000. I, I can't remember if Hartley came on a Thursday or Friday, whatever day of the week it was, but, you know, people were working over the weekend v validating, finding, trying to remediate, put compensating controls in. So, so you got, there was an exec, a level of executive awareness brought to vulnerability management that we probably haven't seen um, in this space, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of executive awareness on the attackers, right? That's that's what makes the front page of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times. You know, the executive awareness hasn't really been there on the VM side, but now this has made it. So there's there's a new awareness here, and I think there's also, and we're going to talk a little bit more about integration with IT ops as we continue on. So I think there's some opportunities here. Um, to, to, do, to, to do a better job working with our IT operations peers to help um, man management understand that we're going to reduce attack footprint, to not focus on we – could, we could do patching and remediation all day long. We've got to be strategic about it and get the best pieces there. But certainly it's, 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 it's made, the way up, made its way up the chain of command. There's a visibility there, and there's a, want, a desire to be more efficient in the way we handle vulnerability management within organizations. I think whatever day of the week Heartbleed came out on was retroactively designated a Monday. So uh, <laughs> why, don't, why don't we move on to step three? You know, you're just kind of making me grin. I, I was thinking back when Heartbleed happened, and I was reaching, I'm in Dallas, and I was kind of texting a bunch of my former colleagues and, and, and maybe even customers when I was a sales engineer, and I was 
thinking to myself, thank God I'm an analyst now, and I don't have to fight the fires that everyone out on the phone and, and, and on the webinar is having to do. There's, there are some benefits in to not having to actually do uh, practitioner work anymore, um, although sometimes I do miss it. So, so next uh, is this integration piece. So this is the fourth tier. This is the yellow part of the hierarchy of needs. Um, and I think this is ab absolutely critical. In fact, I'm actually doing some, um, some research within the vulnerability management space specific to this uh, at Forrester. But then I'm also doing a broader, I'm doing a presentation at a Forrester event in uh, April and then in one in June um, overseas on this whole space and what can we learn from our IT operations friends uh, who are using things like Puppet to help with orchestration. So there's going to be more on this space. But one of the sexy kind of things uh, to say today is we want to create friction for the attackers. We want to slow them down. We want to make their job harder. We want to ca increase their cost to compromise our environment. And I agree, that makes sense, but I like to turn it around. Um, what about all the friction we create ourselves? You know, I think this kind of goes back to my earlier point about we get so focused on the actors and external actors and what's ma mainstream media front page that we're not looking inside. We need to be more introspective. We do a great job of creating friction for ourselves. I think if we're able to reduce internal friction, both from day-to-day -day operations, uh, things like vulnerability management, things like patch and configuration management, to even breach detection and response, you know, it's going to make our, if we can add automation to this, it's going to make us more agile. And naturally, the adversary is going to have a tougher time attacking us, compromising us, because we're going to be able to respond faster. So I think we need to fundamentally address this, this friction that's working, this molasses, this tar pit, you know, insert analogy there, um, uh, that's happening in, inside all of our environments. So I think going back to the, the strategy component where I was saying gap analysis, you know, I think we need to do a gap analysis on our daily functions. Look at your analyst on your team. Look at yourself. What are the top three things that you do, top five things you do every day? every week, monthly, whatever those are, and what's the opportunity to, to automate them? Can you bring in developers? And, you know, I, a lot of people think you have to be a, you know, a financial services firm to have your own development capabilities, but if you are in an area where there's college, and most people are, right, bring in grad students. You know, bring them in as interns. Um, have them start to, you know, give them a, you know, first job out of college kind of pay to, to do the do excuse me, to do the development for you. If you get CS students, you could actually train them to actually maybe be your application security people as they start learning more about the, you know, actual business of security beyond what they learn within, within their school. Um, I think this is, I think that's something that organizations, you know, of all sizes can do is, is bring some, some college grads in to help out with this. Uh, the vendor space is also working on this, right? You know, People like Tripwire are doing things like this. We're going to talk more about that. You know, every vendor that I cover is working on trying to reduce this operational friction. So I would ask that no matter what the technology is you're investing in your RFPs, ask the vendors about what they're doing to kind of handle this space and reduce that operational friction. You know, some, some specific examples that we can talk about um, um, are endpoints and in, in, in automated malware analysis. So this would be sandboxes, right? So the, the example that I like to use here um, that could reduce friction for us, uh, several years ago now, Kaspersky came out, uh, discovered a campaign that they called Net Traveler. And the Net Traveler campaign, the malware in this campaign exploited two known Microsoft Office vulnerabilities. The first version of Net Traveler, there was a subsequent one. So the first version was two known vulnerabilities. So if you got an email with the malware in it, or you clicked on a hyperlink with the malware on a download site, and then it came through a sandbox for inspection, the sandbox would you know, light up like a Christmas tree. We found bad, we found bad, we found bad, um, and give you an alert. Now, what happens if the user that clicked on it was on a Windows machine that was already patched for that? You know, perhaps it's bad and you want to know that the user clicked on it, but you don't want to spend time sending out IR teams, responders, you know, doing your process for a machine that actually did not get compromised. So there's an example of an integration that can say, save time, reduce friction, um, giving that visibility onto the endpoint. Uh, another piece that I want to see more of is, is this vulnerability remediation. You know, most organizations of the size I typically work with, um, although I was in the shop at one point in my career where I was doing both the scanning and remediation myself, but they're, most orgs are passing off remediation to another team. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if I could go into a ticketing system as an IT ops guy, say, hey, I need to patch this server for this vulnerability 
whenever I say closed out, automatically sends a ticket back uh, that talks to the vulnerability management solution that then automatically schedules a remediation validation scan in an approved change window, right? Instead of you having to go back in and look at a queue, it'd be nice if that just happened in the background. So I want to see more of that. Another trend that I'm seeing a lot of my customers, especially larger customers, are interest in integrating their vulnerability management into their governance, risk, and compliance solutions. So these are things like Archer and Metric Stream, um, Agile Alliance, uh, so that they get some of the, the – these solutions a lot of times are tracking some of the, at the corporate risk level. And so then you're tying in this high-level corporate risk. Maybe it's something that you might see in the 10K, and then tying it into the assets uh, in the environment that line up to that risk. And then you can get a picture of the vulnerabilities, you know, what's the actual risk uh, attack surface on that. So being able to integrate that stuff in in a seamless manner, not kludgy, you know, those are some specific examples there within, within um, the VM space and then especially that malware one as everyone's going to malware stuff that let's make these, these wheels actually move a little bit better together. So, Rick, you mentioned uh, hot new technologies sort of at the, at the beginning there. And, and one of the, the – Areas of technology that I keep hearing about from customers and I keep seeing, uh, you know, information about on, on Twitter is, is threat intelligence um, seems to be hot. Have you seen customers or have you had inquiries about um, how to functionally or, or, you know, usefully integrate threat intelligence into their, their existing operations or tools? Yeah, this is, this is I, I think that um, threat intel has kind of supplanted the sandbox as the number one buzzy, buzziness uh, in our space right now. Um, if you guys, if you guys uh, follow me on Twitter, yesterday I, t I tweeted out the links. I, I was a co-chair for the SAN Cyber Threat Intelligence Summit last week in D.C., and I've been sending out the uh, – the, we posted the majority of the slides, and I did a presentation there. So that stuff's available um, for free. If, if you can't find it, just uh, uh, ping me, and I'll let you know where it is. Where we talked about that was one of our focuses on how do you actually operationalize this stuff. Um, it's not enough to have actionable intelligence. I need to integrate it into controls. I think we need to do a whole lot better as an overall community, all the vendors in the space, taking something that is actionable, well, first making it actionable, and then integrating it into controls. Um, there's definitely ways to do this. The easiest, easiest thing that we see today is a lot of the open source type of capability. Solutions that are built on open source are naturally open, right? So if you can take something in a Snort signature as an example or a Yara signature and it's based on actual intelligence and then move it into a control, um, that, that, that's a good example. Uh, also being able to take, let's say you get an MD5 hash from a colleague indicating a piece of malware, you know, then being able to go out into an endpoint security control and, and, and search for that. There's another example of how people are actually doing it. So yes, um, there is reality to the hype, but there's still a lot of hype here. Okay. So I think we're up to step four now, right? Yeah, so prevention. This one is always fun. Um, prevention is not dead. Despite what you've heard, prevention is not dead. Um, I always laugh. You'll often hear prevention is dead statements from vendors that do incident response services. And, of course, it really works out for them if prevention's failing. Now, I don't think anyone's going to argue that prevention's perfect, but imagine a world without prevention. You know, you think we're overwhelmed with alerts today? Um, imagine how many alerts we would have if we didn't have signature-based antivirus, if we didn't have signatures in our, in our IPSs that were blocking things. Um, prevention is shifting. Um, you're seeing more and more uh, prevention getting moved into the you know, proactive or predictive type of state. Maybe an example there would be um, you, know, you have this particular domain, this particular ASN, this particular registrar is known for sending you know, having malicious content. So I'm just going to, I know this, and I'm going to block it. Um, or even the fact that maybe you have a domain that's newly registered, it has no history. That's indicative of something that's going to be used for that, and you block that. So prevention is definitely shifting. Um, I, I think it is important to understand how much our investment is in prevention versus, you know, detection and response. And I think we need more investment in detection and response. I mean, it, it, it's a good segue in a minute to, to the next when we move into detection and response, but certainly prevention is not going away. But I think for you, going back to this gap analysis that we talked about, just look, is the prevent, you know, the prevention that we do have today, is it being useful, yes or no? Um, and if it's not, can we retire it and move to something else that may be more useful? You know, just part of that gap analysis component. But yeah, it's, it's definitely not going anywhere. 
it always seems to me like uh, the prevention and detection debate is really not not a debate, but more like a pendulum, and it you know it swings either to one one side or the other, and and you know now we're kind of on a on an upswing towards detection, but isn't aren't the preventative preventive controls really part of the fundamentals that we shouldn't skip over? Yeah, I I, I think so, um, and I do think there is a swing, and you know it also you hear. A lot of the vendors that focus on detection response talking about, you know, everyone talks about what they do a good job of. So, but but I, but I think it is. I think prevention, as we've historically known it, is a fundamental. We need to be doing it. Um, you know, even some of the new prevention technologies that are, that are emerging, you know, that's almost fundamental to me because we want to reduce noise. And as we start talking about more sophisticated adversaries in the next couple slides, you know, that'll kind of make sense. We need to free up our resources so that we can. Uh, Focus on the most, you know, the, the challenge that I make to all the vendor clients of mine is what I need you to do for my customers, and, and this would be you guys out on the, on the call today, right, is I need you to help them identify the most important alerts that they need to respond to right now with their limited resources. I want you to eliminate false positives. I assume that. But I also want you to help people understand what are the legitimate alerts that they're not going to be able to respond to, right? I have 100 alerts. I can only get to 10. All 100 are legit. All 100 are somebody bad in my environment, but I need to know the 10 that are the most important, most, most, the largest threat to my organization. That's kind of the challenge that I think many, many vendors in this space are trying to address. Uh, it's interesting. I've never heard that before. We, we just assume that all of our customers have unlimited resources and can address <laughs> all of the alerts. Well, and you know, too, even, even with, and, and I know you guys see it with, with some of your biggest customers, you know, there, there's almost a fallacy of thought that I've had. Uh, that if I go in and I talk to a Fortune 50 company, that they're going to have you know unlimited resources, they're going to be able to solve all problems. It doesn't matter if you're the smallest of the small. You know, you're the one-man IT guy who also does security from time to time. To you're part of a very large team with lots of functional roles. Everyone struggles with the resources. Yeah, prioritization is a universal. Absolutely. Yep. All right, so let's move on to the top of the hierarchy, and this is where the detection and response component. This is from some research that I did in um, September or October uh, called Know Your Adversary, just talking about the threat landscape um, and, and how the lines are blurring between the criminals and the state actors and the hacktivists with some examples. Right on the state actors, I, I definitely should add some other flags on there. I could populate that whole little circle with, with other countries, but, you know, um, Iran and Syria as two, two recent examples over the past two years or so that would be good here. But the threat landscape has got a lot of different people in it. Um, not everyone's threat model is the same, but I also think you need to keep your eyes on, on what the different threat actors are doing in case they've decided to start targeting your, your industry. You know, one of the things that I think is important, and I was talking about, you know, what are the most important alerts, and this is easy to say, not easy to do. This didn't come out so well here. Um, there's, this is actually, if, if, I'll give you, if you're interested in this, I actually kind of recommend this for people to include in their presentations to management. Um, this is from the Department of Defense, Defense Science Board, and they basically had a resilient military system um, and the advanced cyber threat presentation they did for one of the Senate uh, or congressional subcommittees. And this basically is talking about the tiers of adversary that are out there. At the bottom uh, of the triangle, you've got the lower tiers, and these are kind of script kitties, and they're spending thousands of dollars. In the middle tier, you have some of your criminal organizations. These guys are able to discover their own zero days, and they could spend millions. And at the top, you have your states, right? These guys can create vulnerabilities. Full spectrum is what it says there. Full spectrum is human intelligence, you know, all the powers of tradecraft that a state has. Um, and they could spend, um, in this case, potentially billions of dollars targeting. Um, and maybe they have in the background. The Snowden docs kind of tell us what that high-level adversary is. You know, I think it's important to, to know that the, the more skilled an adversary is targeting you, the more important detection and response is, uh, because, and that's actually the next slide. Um, it's your only option. Prevention is not going to work. And a good example of this is Microsoft's uh, EMET. That's their Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, which is their kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, zero-day prevention is a good, you know, I guess that's a good generalization. Um, but it's designed to, to stop the, the processes that malicious um, malware, you know, certain system calls that are made, not signatures but behavior. Researchers disable this all the time. Um, so if someone's targeting you and you have one of these kind of, you know, whiz-bang prevention solutions, it's, it's not necessarily going to work. So you're going to have to fall back here, especially when you're dealing with those ninjas, right? The higher capability that someone has, the more difficult they are going to be to prevent. Something else that I think is important here 
uh, is to think is that there is no single technology that you can buy to be to be your breach detection, right? Um, it's about the aggregate of, of of your environment and your capabilities. So. When the Sony breach occurred, there was practically a, a national debate about um, attribution for that, that compromise. But uh, for the, the sort of average organization, how important is accurate attribution in uh, you know, detection and response as a process? It's such a good question, Tim. Yeah, anybody that's on Twitter is probably so beat down from the Sony, you know, from about middle December still to this day about all the debates that occur about attribution. Um, a lot of times, I think organizations hyper focus on attribution. Um, you know, the, the, I, I work with some clients that are very mature and they have the capabilities to actually do some some. You know, we're not law enforcement. We don't have the ability to go out and subpoena records from ISPs, from Google, from Microsoft to start understanding the pivoting and the hot points that adversaries are going through to target us. Um, I think it's important to understand, broadly speaking, right. Are we being targeted by someone at the lower end of this uh, pyramid, you know, a script kitty, or someone at the top? And, and, and if it's someone at the top, right, you know, we may have to fall back to detection response over and over and over again versus if the, someone that's less capable, you'll be able to stop them. So I think it's important to understand the capabilities that, 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 that's, that's being targeted. I don't think who's on the keyboard is important for us as you know, commercial entities for nonprofits. You know, if you're a three-letter agency and you're military for, for a nation, you know, that's a whole different story. Attribution is a different piece there. Um, I think one thing I would say too is don't think that there's only one actor operating in an environment. Chances are if there's one person in the environment, there's a whole lot of people in the environment. And as if the adversaries weren't challenging enough we have this, right? This is the new enterprise. Now, not everyone is like me where I'm connected to a Forrester office once a month when I do expense reports through a VPN and I go into a Forrester office, you know, four or five times a year and that's it. Um, but you may have people that are just occasionally working in right there. So your, your controls are outside of your enterprise. So a lot of your traditional network-based controls, they're not going to work anymore unless you're backhauling all of your traffic, which some people do. Uh, but backhauling that traffic to a corporate office could result in a, in a poor, less than ideal user experience. This is a, a graphic that I did for um, the, the same research, the target attack hierarchy of needs. This is from the second part, talking about the need to balance endpoint and network security. They work well together. Endpoint security has challenges. You know, no one, no, we have enough challenges. I'm a, I'm a recovering endpoint security administrator. I manage like five or six different agents. It's always difficult to add new agents. You know, when there's a new capability that exists, I'd rather my existing agents add that capability or have that capability than have to add something brand new to it. Um, but there are some challenges with endpoint security, just like network security has challenges, one of them being people are outside of your walls. So there really is a balance that's necessary from a detection and response perspective on the endpoint, on the network. I won't go through all of those specifics on there, but I think you get the idea. Um, you know, talking about the, the kind of integration use case, again, you know, this goes back kind of to Tim's question from before on the threat intelligence side. You know, what are some examples on the endpoint side in particular, but this also applies to the network uh, with threat intelligence. And the one that I mentioned was getting an MD5, which is a very low level uh, threat indicator and searching for that. Um, one thing I think is really important to mention too is not just looking at signatures, looking for behaviors, right? You know, we need to be careful that threat intelligence doesn't become, you know, the snort signature, you know, the untuned snort alert um, or snort signature that was firing off all over the place, right? We need relevant threat intelligence that's actionable. There's a lot of buzzwords right there. Um, uh, but not just rely on that. Also have the ability to look for strange behavior that's been happening on these hosts, not having to rely on necessarily a signature. We need multiple capabilities there. Um, the other piece on the endpoint, right, is obviously incident response. And the first thing I always wanted to know on an incident response, maybe not the first thing, is I find a compromised host. What other hosts are compromised? Do I have the ability to go out and inventory? Do I have this malware on other hosts? Uh, do I have a weird scheduled task on other hosts, right? Because once the bad guys get into your environment, you need the ability to do the detection based on non-malware signatures, right? Because a lot of times they're using PowerShell, they're using scheduled tasks, <clears throat> they're using NetStack commands. You know, there's there's got to be ability to see more than just something 
uh, you know, MD5 for a malicious, MD5 hash for a malicious piece of code. It's really, really important. Um, one, <clears throat> pardon me, final thought, and I kind of alluded to that a little bit um, on a previous slide, is that there is no such thing as a breach detection solution, right? You cannot buy a single box for us. You know, I've got clients asking me about this. Really, your breach detection capabilities are, are, are your tools, your people enabled by process. And, 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 and in that process, we have that automation and that integration that's reducing that friction for you. So that's really what the pieces are. That we'll never be able to buy, as much as I would like for us to, the one thing that's going to solve all of our problems. Really, it's all of these things working together. And it's working together within one vendor's portfolio and extending out to others. Because you know, we do try to minimize our strategic vendors. But ultimately, we have a lot of different, play, a lot of different uh, vendors in our technology stack, and we need them to work together as well. One thing, it just, in fact, this is the report that I mentioned from um, a couple of the graphics, the Know Your Adversary research. Um, so I do, you, you don't have to be a Forrester client to get free research, and so I always like to kind of make people aware of that. Um, if you're interested in doing research interviews that are confidential, you know, help me understand the state of, of, of your world, the problems you're dealing with, with vulnerability management, incident response, threat intelligence, those are some of the main focus areas for me. Um, I give people free free copy of research. So if that's something you're interested in, follow me on Twitter, follow my blog. When I start new research, I always you know make people aware of that. And like I say, we're always looking to do about 15 to 20 research interviews per piece of uh, research that we work on. So the last slide for me, I think, <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's it. I'm going to hand it off to Tim now, and then uh, we'll continue on. All right, Rick, that was awesome. Uh, so I now have the pleasure of talking for just a couple of minutes. Um, but these couple of minutes are really there for you to take the time to enter your questions into the Q&A section. So um, if, you, if you prefer, you can hum some appropriate music to yourself while you think of the questions. But uh, now's the time to enter those questions. And uh, I'll go through four slides, and then we'll take questions and, uh, and uh, answer them. So um, obviously, Tripwire, uh, you know, we have a particular appreciation for the research that, that Rick does. And, and we try and uh, uh, do a good job of aligning our product with um, what he sees in the market as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Tripwire Adaptive Threat Protection, um, which is a solution that we have in market today uh, intended to do some of the things that we've talked about around integration. So we want to take our um, uh, pieces of intelligence, the context that we have about the environment with Tripwire products, and pair it with things like threat intelligence in order to allow customers uh, to do something useful in their environment, to improve their ability to do threat analytics or detect zero days. Um, one of the examples Rick gave was determining, you know, finding a compromised host and then determining what other hosts are compromised in the same way. Um, those are the kinds of things that we're aiming to, to do with the adaptive threat protection solution from Tripwire. Um, and it's not just a solution, it's also a bunch of products. So to put some product names on that uh, as well, um, we have Tripwire Enterprise, which uh, many of you might be familiar with, uh, and there are a few different flavors of that secure configuration management uh, product with uh, File Integrity Manager and uh, the Agentless Configuration Compliance Manager. And then on the vulnerability management side, which is uh, a relatively a, a newer product from Tripwire, really, is IP360 and a cloud-based version called uh, Tripwire Pure Cloud. Uh, and there's also Tripwire Log Center, which um, can help with secure and reliable log collection. Uh, and all of those things can be brought together with um, a number of partners uh, in an integrated fashion to help uh, drive an adaptive threat protection solution within the, the, the customer environment. Um, because ultimately, while it's nice for us to put solutions and products in market, we're really about solving a customer problem uh, and, and one that matters. Um, and we like to think of it uh, in terms of a, an enterprise cyber threat gap, uh, three gaps, in fact, uh, the detection gap, the response gap, and the prevention gap. So our goal uh, is really to help our customers close those gaps um, with the solutions and tools that, that we put in place. Uh, and finally, I promised four slides. So last slide, uh, there are some reasons why uh, folks uh, pick Tripwire as a vendor, as a partner, and a trusted advisor. Um, you know, we're trusted. Um, we build open architectures to, to, to facilitate integration because um, ultimately there are lots of tools out there and you're going to buy some from Tripwire and some from other vendors and we need to play well in your environment and ecosystem to be as effective as possible. Um, we aim at, at, at high fidelity, high accuracy, um, and at resilient tools in the environment as well. So with that, I will move on to the question section. Um, and if you have a question, you can still enter it in the Q&A uh, widget at the bottom. Uh, and uh, the first question we have uh, is, 
uh, I think, Rick, this is probably a good question for you to answer. Um, you had mentioned that there's no such thing as a, a breach detection product. What technologies would you say are part of breach detection overall? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one. Well, I kind of hinted at it with the, uh, that, that balance that I have between the endpoint and the network. Um, you have to have both network-based security controls and endpoint security controls. You've got to have something, like right now, if you don't have visibility into your laptops and what they're doing when they're outside your perimeter, you know, that's a big, big challenge for you there. Um, malware sandboxes, although, you know, they've, they've become ubiquitous, they are still doing a good job of, it's still a tool for us, so I think there's a role there. I think it's important to understand that an advanced adversary is going to find a way to compromise your environment that perhaps doesn't even, you know, pass to a channel that you have visibility into from, from a malware analysis perspective. So, but I think that's a component of it there. Um, you know, really I think the ability to go out and collect data from all of your nodes, your endpoints, to be able to get <clears throat> visibility beyond your perimeter. You know, a lot of organizations just have layer three and layer four visibility at the edge. I think you need to have, you know, layer seven visibility at your edge. But I also think we need, and this is a component of zero trust here, you know, the technology network visibility, we call it network analysis and visibility, um, but that network visibility needs to move into the inside of the environment so that once the bad guys get in, you actually could see what they're doing, detect lateral movement, pivoting, you know, machines, talking to machines they don't normally do, that sort of thing, be able to detect that reconnaissance. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some high-level ones there. You know, analytics comes into play there as well, but I definitely think endpoint approach network approach, um, you know, really things that give you situational awareness in the environment. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, one, uh, here's a question that's probably from me. Uh, uh, do you offer security tools for Linux? Um, I think that's for me, not for you, Rick. Uh, the short answer there is yes. Um, you can find a lot of information on the, the Tripwire website um, about the platforms we support, but we support a, a variety of flavors of, of Linux as well. And uh, let's see. Uh, another question for you, Rick, here. Um, how can I tell what skill level an attack has, or an attacker has, rather, uh, while I'm responding to an incident? So that's a really good question as well. And sometimes it's going to depend on the maturity of your organization. Uh, if someone's using a zero day, that would be indicative of an advanced adversary, or at least someone that knows how to buy a zero day. So there, there could be a distinction. It could be difficult there. So I, I, a lot of times it will come down to tradecraft. And I, in fact, in that Know Your Adversary doc, I wrote a little bit about this. But, you know, adversaries that don't do a good job of covering their steps, that don't go through and clear logs, could be indicative of the kind of smash and grab. We don't care if you know about us. Um, in a lot of cases, organizations might need help from a third party uh, this is where some of the threat intelligence, commercial threat intelligence providers might be able to help out where you say, oh, we found this particular tool. Do you know about this tool? And then you get kind of that wider perspective on what's going on. This also could be useful for your peer groups, you know, circle of trust, people, you're there. Hey, we found this tool being used this way. Have you seen it before? Is it unique? That sort of thing. So I think there's a number of different ways, but, you know, the tools that they're using, um, the, the malware that they're writing, so your, your malware analysis guys, and how, is, it, is it packed? How well are they obfuscating their malware, trying to make it more difficult for you? There's a number of just kind of quick examples, at least, so you could tell some sophistication of, of the adversaries that are there. But a lot of times the way you get to know about adversaries is lack of, uh, of uh, operational security, OPSEC. You know, people make mistakes. Um, as a, an attacker matures, a lot of times they improve their operational security. Uh, they... they <clears throat> You know, unskilled adversary might make a mistake or completely fail to anonymize, you know, their, their, where they're coming from in your environment. So it really comes down to maturity of tradecraft and, and tools. Do the um, different threat intelligence providers and vendors in the market, are they, are they different? Do they provide different information depending, you know, are they different types? Yeah, there's, there's a kind of a wide variety of, uh, I'm actually writing some research on this, there's kind of a wide variety of players out there. You've got some that provide very you know, what you might call an atomic indicator. It's, you know, network information, layer three, layer four type of information uh, from a network, source IP, destination, domain name. Um, you get some endpoint hashes, MD5 hashes, SHAs, that sort of thing um, that you could then try to put into a security control to do hunting or to do prevention. Then you have 
a higher tier um, of intelligence where they're actually giving you lots of context around that. So this is the tool that they were using. This is how they use it. This is how they typically pivot within an environment. This is what their targeting looks like. Context around that adversary group. May not know who's on the other end of the keyboard, but they've seen certain traits long enough to know that this is probably this particular threat actor. You also have open source intelligence where you're going out and using crawlers, um, uh, going through peer-to-peer -peer sites, things like that, to gather information, going into forums, that sort of thing, to see what you can gather around targeting of your information, looking for your IP. So there's a broad range. Typically, there's not a single provider that, that most organizations can go to. Um, I would just say don't get distracted by it. Uh, uh, you know, one place a lot of orgs might start off is I'm going to get some type of threat feed, and it's going to get sent to my sim, and it's going to give me some context. Now, a lot of people that are more mature kind of scoff at that, but the reality is that for many companies, that may be the most mature exercise in threat intelligence they ever have the capability to do, and that's okay. Not everyone can be GE cert or Lockheed Martin cert. Fair enough. All right. If anybody has any last questions, um, feel free to type them in, uh, but be quick about it. Otherwise... Uh, we will thank you all for your time uh, and wrap up here. Rick, uh, it was really a pleasure. Um, I think it was certainly educational and useful uh, for me, so I, I imagine it was useful for everyone else as well. And um, uh, thanks again for the, the time. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you both, Rick Holland of Forrester Research and Tim Erlin of Tripwire. And thank you to you, our audience, today for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and to the slides. Also, you may reply to that email if you'd like to earn a CPE credit for attending today. We hope you'll join us for future webcasts. Go ahead and check out uh, tripwire.com and also our blog, State of Security. Thank you and have a great day.